photographers, I'm sure that many of you believe that Nikon's color science is excellent, and although I tend to agree, I'm not really sure what that means. This video, which will appeal mostly to photo and color geeks, hopefully sheds some light. Now, with the Nikon Z9, I'm going to create some test images, then with histogram, waveform, and vector scope displays, see if we can figure out what Nikon's color science is. Of course, I'll also demonstrate all of the additional settings and controls available for photographers to manipulate those settings for their creative intentions. Now, this is the DSC Labs test chart. It's often used as a professional reference, as DSC Labs provides us with a digital sample, so we know exactly the color and luminance values that these chips represent. Properly exposed, the chart's gray chips should transition smoothly from a true black to a full white, and the color chips guide accurate skin tones across a range of skin colors. I captured a custom white balance and exposed this image slightly hot on the meter, but with the histogram comfortably from the right, all of the gray steps are clearly visible. Now, I selected the standard or default picture control. For still images, picture control does not affect a raw file, only the JPEG image. And here's the image. Final Cut resized it to fit this 4K resolution video. I have cropped the edges, concentrating first on the gray chips from dark to light. We'll get back to color in a bit. Let's start with the distribution of the gray scale in the profiles. On a waveform display, the bidirectional gray chips create an X. Those are the IRE units on the left axis. The horizontal axis is the image left to right. If you're not familiar with waveform, it's used for video and this represents the SDR, or Standard Dynamic Range values. The brightest chips should be close to zero, the darkest close to 100. Broadcast television only allows zero to 100. That's what broadcast legal means. Now, for real geeks, the three central black and white chips represent the video extremes. The black chips should be zero, the white chips beside 100%. In video terms, an image that takes full advantage of that dynamic range would be properly exposed. Those are adjustments I could make using Final Cut's exposure control tools, pulling the shadows down and the highlights up. The middle gray of the background registers about 50%, but the X does not cross at 50. The brightest 50% of the chart gets less than 40% of the full range, the darker values getting proportionately more. Adjusting the midtones can make the distribution a little more equal, taking full advantage of the available dynamic range, if that is your creative intent. Let's go back to an unadjusted standard picture profile image, move it to the side, and add the neutral picture profile on the right. On the waveform, we can see small differences in the gray chips. The bright isn't as bright the dark not as dark, reducing the contrast in the image. The steps are slightly more evenly balanced. And that's a little more obvious when I switch back and forth. Vivid Picture Control has nearly the same grayscale balance as standard. Differences are visible when switching between the two. Mono raises all levels slightly. Again, alternating reveals the subtle changes. The portrait profile reveals more shadow detail. Switching back and forth, the darkest steps are more visible. In landscape, the shadows are darker. Again, most obvious when going back and forth. Flat, with raised shadows and lowered highlights, compresses the dynamic range, and as a result, the image has less contrast. The advantage this has, particularly while recording video, is that it's less likely that darker shadows will be crushed or that highlights will be blown. And should you or I wish to adjust this, recreating a wider dynamic range, that's possible, particularly if the image is recorded using a 10-bit codec with 422 color sampling, which shows less degradation when larger adjustments are made. My adjustment process is to first use the master to center the scene at 50, then pulling the highlights up to nearly 100, shadows down to zero. 
well, let's reveal the left and right color chips, which represent variations on skin tones. Levels range from 25 to about 65, which, if you're using a waveform to set skin tones, is slightly lower than the desired range. However, for color, a vector scope provides a more interesting display. The line between 10 and 11 o'clock represents skin tones, because no matter the shade of our skin, the red blood cells that provide the basic hue is about the same. The test chart's values are slightly counterclockwise from what the scope considers ideal. And this is the first indication we have of Nikon's color science intention. Again, using Final Cut's color tools, I'm making a two degree clockwise adjustment, aligning the chips perfectly. So, so it seems that Nikon makes a two degree counterclockwise adjustment to make skin tones skew slightly to yellow from red. The distance that a trace goes from center is the amount of saturation. When I increase the saturation, the length increases, revealing the distinct values of the individual chips. Let's reset those adjustments. When we look at neutral, the saturation is reduced. For vivid, it's increased, but the position doesn't rotate. Mono has no color information. For portrait, slightly reduced saturation. It's subtle, so more obvious when we switch between the two. As higher values for portrait also desaturate, that's part of the effect we're seeing. In landscape, skin tones rotate two degrees clockwise, closer to the recommended skin tone position. And between standard and landscape, as there's also an increase in shadow tones, this is hard to see except on the scope. It's a little clearer alternating between portrait and landscape, but again, change in shadow tones also plays a role. Anyway, for me, that really confirms Nikon's intent with skin tones. Flat also has the slight counterclockwise shift. Let's reveal the remainder of the colors. I'm increasing global saturation from 1 to 1.75, making color positions a little more clear. On a vector scope, a fully saturated color would fall inside the color indicator boxes. Further increases in saturation just introduce distortions. But by exaggerating the saturation, maybe it's possible to see Nikon's color intentions. Yellow, red, magenta, even blue seem to be more saturated than green and cyan. Red seems to be headed directly for its indicator, and while I felt that skin tones required a slight clockwise adjustment, the other colors are generally shifted counterclockwise. A skilled colorist would use the image captured by the camera, making the adjustments needed to bring all the colors into line. Neutral has a similar color balance to standard with reduced saturation. Vivid is the opposite, increased saturation. The traces remain similar. Portrait saturation is lower than standard, and several of the color traces shift. When the saturation of the standard profile is reduced to 0.9, the adjustment is clearer. While red remains the same, the position and saturation of the other traces move slightly. The net result is, hopefully, more pleasing skin tones. For landscape, an overall increase in saturation with no obvious rotational changes. For flat, an overall decrease in saturation, positioning remains the same. Let's return to the standard image and use the controls to make adjustments to the individual settings available. On the waveform, reducing contrast to it minimum minus three provides a predictable result, a lower dynamic range. Back to standard, and now reducing the brightness to its minimum, minus 1.5, is also a predictable overall exposure reduction. While the maximum brightness, plus 1.5, starts to distort the chart, compressing the brighter chips to a narrower range. Back to standard, and using the vector scope, here's a three-point reduction in saturation, and a three-point increase. Again, fairly predictable results but never extreme. Now finally, starting again with standard, the three-point reduction in hue, that's a clockwise rotation, about five degrees, a three-point increase, about five degrees counterclockwise. Interestingly, when I make those rotational adjustments, 
There seem to be ancillary effects. Not sure what to make of those. Then there are 20 more picture control images. They're like filters or recipes, and while I think they're more gimmicky than useful, no judgment should you find a creative purpose for these. The waveforms and vector scopes for these probably won't affect your decision to use them, but does give some insight into the changes made. It would be interesting if Nikon provided access to the full suite of controls required to make these changes. I hope that helps us all realize that the default settings are really the starting point. Color science starts with an accurate or consistent white balance for your scene, but then, based on the color profile or picture control, to use Nikon's term, you choose, and the adjustments that you make, Nikon's colors can really be exactly what you want. That, of course, also applies pretty much to any camera that has the kinds of settings and controls provided here. So, so I'm not sure if you can fine-tune one of Fujifilm's film simulations to match the results you'd get on an icon. It'd certainly be fun to try. Just don't get stuck using only the defaults. Experimenting on a digital camera is pretty much free. Create images until your memory card is full and your battery is empty. Now, as my hashtag says, I am not sponsored, so there are no interruptions while you're watching my videos. And that decision has a financial impact, so I am very grateful to my members, although I think of you as my sponsors. If membership is for you, please use the join button below. Subscribing remains free, and I do read and reply to all civil comments and relevant questions. Thank you for watching. Stay safe.